everyone. This is Marianne, and I'm here with Emily Jerdy. <laughs> you know, Emily, I always said your name wrong. I'm so sorry. I was always saying Emily Gerdy, Gerdy, because that's a German <laughs> pronunciation. So forgive me. Oh gosh, no worries. I'll take anything. I. <laughs> Cool. So today we thought we have a conversation between the two of us. So you have been hearing Emily's voice a lot more in your ear. And I thought it would be fun if you get to know Emily better. We had a podcast before where we talked about Emily and her tiny home and the book she was writing. And Emily, why don't you start out telling us a little bit about your book? Yeah, since we last chatted, my book is out and it came out, I think, February 27th. It is Minimalist Living for a Maximum Life. It is available on Amazon. It's available at Target, Walmart, and Barnes and Noble. Basically, anywhere books are sold as of now is pretty much mainly online, but I'm working to get it in libraries and get the word out. And I'm really excited. I, I've had some really great feedback. People are feeling really good because it's an easy read. It's just kind of simple steps and talks about our life and our journeys and how minimalist living changed our lives forever and how, you know, mindful, sustainable practices can change the world. Very cool. Is it available as an ebook as well? As of now, it's only available as a book. I am working with my publisher, which is Kensington Publishing Corporation, and I will be, yes, working with them. I, I'd like to also do an audiobook because as a mom, I listen to a lot of audiobooks because that's kind of the only time we have, right, is in the car on the ride to, from place to place. So I will be working on that here shortly. Yeah, that's funny. I was just talking to somebody and they were saying, oh, I'm not reading books anymore. And their friend was like, but you told me about this book and this and this, and they're like, yeah, ah, it's audiobooks. <laughs> I, I think this is where a lot of us are, are moving towards, myself included. I love reading, but I'm a little bit older now and my eyes get tired. And so in the evening, when it would be some quiet time to read, a lot of times I just can't concentrate on a page anymore. And so I love listening to books. So that's a really good direction. Yeah, well, you definitely have to keep us updated when the audiobook is available. <laughs> and that sounds so fun. Yeah, yeah. I actually just applied to be on Oprah and Ellen and I'm sending them my book. Um, so we will see maybe some big exciting things coming and would love to, you know, just get out there and help people heal. That's so exciting. I usually don't watch TV, but I would watch if you <laughs> <laughs> Your answer shows for sure. So you were saying your book is about your life and how you found minimalistic living. And I think your life has changed recently. So I wanted to talk about that. When we first talked, where were you living? So when we first talked, we were still in Minnesota where we were born and raised. And we had built our tiny house there and we had our community there. But tiny house living in Minnesota, as far as doing it, Legally and getting zoning changes, we worked with several counties and, you know, talked to a lot of people and tried to get communities started there. And they're just not quite ready. They're getting there. I believe they're building a tiny house homeless community in St. Paul as of now, um, or at least it's in the works. But it just really wasn't moving at a fast enough pace for us. So we've always had our eyes out west and we've always enjoyed vacationing out west and we pretty much every time we say we're going to go somewhere, we always go somewhere, you know, west. So we were like, all right, we're going to move. So we got ourselves all packed up and we are actually in a camper right now in Colorado. And we're working with some amazing people here to get tiny house communities on the, on the map. And there are already several more here than there are in Minnesota. So they've are, it's already, you know, moving a little bit quicker here. So we really feel pretty confident that we're going to have one up within the next year or so. So you're saying there are already some established tiny house communities in Colorado? Yeah, there's one that is strictly for like as a hotel or Airbnb. And I believe there's a couple more in the works. And there's a homeless tiny house community right in Denver. 
Um, and they did a really great job getting that going. So, you know, the, the conversation is much more being talked about in city city council meetings and whatnot. So we're, we're pretty confident that we can start talking to local city members and get the ball rolling. Where are you trying to get that community started? As of now, we're focusing west of Denver. There uh, tends to be a little bit more land in that area and it's closer to the mountains and pretty much anywhere west of Denver. We're trying to shoot for less than an hour commute because most tiny homeowners are, you know, try to work from home, but many of them, you know, you have to maybe go in the office a couple times a week. So we want to stick to where, you know, jobs are available to make sure that everyone can have an opportunity to work as well. That makes complete sense. How many people do you think would fit into a community or is there any size which is preferable or is it open to whatever land you can find? How does it work? Yeah, so what we're trying to do is build communities that really fit into the community already there. So a lot of the tiny house communities that are in the works or that are finished are more of an RV model where you're fitting as much into you know, the area as you can. So it's really for profit. And we're coming at it from more of a nonprofit cooperative community type of viewpoint. So we're really looking for something that looks like your standard community, like an HOA where you, you know, everyone's got their, you know, fourth acre or more and everyone's got their little yard and there's a playground and community gardens. So we're really coming at it from this is not to make money. This is so people have a safe comfortable place to live more sustainably. So that's really, you know, the difference that we're seeing and what our mission is, is going to be a little bit different. So we're really hoping that cities will really latch onto that, knowing that we want it to be um, as closely matched to what's already there. Because as we all know, change happens slowly. So we want to make sure that we still look like the status quo, but in a sustainable fashion. So you would basically each have like a piece of property and have your tiny house on it. Are you also planning then on having community spaces or is it more just, okay, we are all living here and we're making sure that the zoning is good for tiny house living? Yeah, it's definitely going to be presented as a community. So there'll you know, be a central building with probably, you know, like a library and shared washer dryer and perhaps like a place to hold events and a place for, you know, yoga or meditation or, you know, kind of rooms to rent out. And so we really, yeah, it's definitely going to be very community-based. There's going to be an application to get into the community to make sure everyone has the same, you know, expectations for sustainability and non-toxic and, you know, making sure it's as environmentally friendly as possible. And just, you know, a lot of communities have failed because it's not everyone's in it together, which is, again, where the cooperative comes from. So it's going to be, as a nonprofit, it's going to be, you know, you're kind of, you know, investing in this mission versus I'm just looking for a spot to park. So that's kind of our goal. That sounds really interesting. You are already working with people, right? You already have found people which have the same ideas. Yep, yep. We have. We already are. We formed a you know board of directors, and we can't say too much until we get ourselves launched here. But yeah, we we have a group of people working together on a common goal, and we will be you know creating a nonprofit, and we're um, really looking forward to just seeing how this develops as far as you know making it. Making it so that we can replicate this across the country so that, you know, the tiny house movement is growing so quickly and cities are going to have to find a place to put people. So we're sort of offering one idea. It's not the only idea, but we do, you know, we want it to be more family based and community based versus, you know, in and out, you know, a lot of RV parks where tiny homes are. It's a very, you know, mobile community, which is fine. And the love, some people love that, but we're looking for more like, hey, we want to stick around for a little bit. We want our kids to play together. 
We want to have educational resources and a community garden and perhaps a farm to table. So we're throwing out some really fun ideas to see, you know, ways that we can make this uh, sustainable that, you know, both financially and environmentally. Sounds good. So I, I guess what I was looking for is that you're actually forming a nonprofit entity, which then can be like the legal background for it's not just a loose group of people dreaming. <laughs> you're actually going to put a structure to that. Yes, correct. And then create a model. So how did your travels go? Tell us about your travels. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's been a, such a fun adventure. So we were thinking of selling our tiny house so we could pay off our student loans. So we purchased a camper. And then as fate would have it, we decided to keep our tiny house. So we now have our camper here in Colorado and our tiny house will be joining us shortly. So we will be doing tours and education through the tiny house while we build this community or find property to live on for the time being as the community gets built. So it's been a really neat adventure. We are loving Colorado. We've already moved twice. Uh, the first spot was not the best fit for our family. So we're now in another spot that's working out really well. And we're really close to where everything's happening. So we can be a lot more involved in getting zoning changes done more quickly and meeting with community members and just being more a part of the community where we're actually thinking of building. So that was a really wonderful benefit. Um, of course, it's been interesting, but, you know, that's the life on wheels, right? You, <laughs> you're you always evolving, always moving, always changing. And it's been a wild ride, but we're, we're learning to go with the flow and enjoy the adventure. That sounds excellent. A technical question. So you came with your RV and I'm assuming you didn't have another car or did you drag one of, you know, like you see a lot of times RVs with a little car tracking behind? Yeah, my amazing mother-in-law drove our second car out here and with a toddler that's essential because my husband, you know, he takes one car to work and then I homeschool slash unschool our son. So we find ourselves constantly day to day going to libraries or museums or parks or hikes or meeting up with other homeschoolers. So yeah, that was a wonderful blessing. So yes, we are lucky enough to have two cars here. We were going to try to do one car, but just because needing to have the the truck to pull the house, we didn't really want to be driving the truck all over the place because that's obviously not sustainable as far as gas and we and just environmentally. So we do as much as we can driving the little car around. Yeah, that, that was kind of in my mind. If you came with an RV and you're parked far away from a city, it might be hard to get around. And, you know, also things to consider when you go on an adventure like that. So you actually have two cars and you can utilize if you have to. Yeah, yeah. And it's been really important. I, you just, you know, for example, yesterday I went to the meeting celebrating the homeless tiny home community uh, coming to completion. So we had a wonderful info meeting and I'm actually going to have them on the podcast here soon. And, you know, I had to drive a little bit further. So I drove the car and then my husband had my son at a park. So <laughs> as much as we would love to be a one car family at this time in our lives, it's, we've tried it. We actually did do one car for a while in Minnesota and it worked for a little while, but you know, just with needing to be so involved in the community out here, we, we're thoroughly enjoying both cars. <laughs> yeah, I, there are cities where it's easier to use public transportation. Here in San Diego, it's almost impossible. It it takes you three hours to go somewhere where it would take you maybe 20 minutes in a car. And it's too far to walk. <laughs> you know, it would take you all day to walk too. And public transportation is just not happening here. So sometimes it's just, you know, like we want to, but there are certain things we have to do just because of circumstances and how life is if if you don't want to stay home all day long, I suppose. Now, when your house comes to you, how is it, how is it going to come? <laughs> yeah, so our house weighs about between 16 and 18,000 pounds empty. So we hire a driver. He, we found him in Minnesota. He specializes in tiny home 
um, transportation and he's insured. So we trust him. He does an amazing job. So we hire him to drive it out to us and he's the most affordable to, for us to pull our tiny house from Minnesota to Colorado, it'll be 1500 and that actually is about half of what other people are offering. So I would love to link his information for other tiny homeowners because he's affordable, he's insured, and he's experienced. So a lot of people will do like the U-Haul thing and have, you know, actually drive it out themselves, but we don't feel very comfortable. <laughs> we would want to, you know, take some classes first on how to drive this huge thing. And Really tiny houses aren't aerodynamic. You know, our, our camper is meant for driving. It's, you know, got a curved front. Everything is lightweight. These tiny houses are just a brick going down the road. So very boxy, very heavy. So yeah, I would, it, it's kind of like suddenly driving a huge semi truck, which totally different dimensions. And, you know, everything is different. Yeah, I can see how you would somebody with experience do the driving. Now, when it comes to Colorado, do you need to have found a permanent place by then? We're still looking. So if any of our listeners live in Colorado, <laughs> as of now, it will just be sitting in the tiny home builders lot. They are tiny home connection and we'll be doing tours so that we can educate people on our build and what works for us, what we would have changed. And so we'll be doing a lot of, it'll be a great resource for education. Whereas when we were living in it, we really didn't have that opportunity with so many cats and a dog and a toddler and nap times. And so this is going to be a really fun opportunity for us to use our house as a resource. So we're pretty excited for that. And then coming forward, depending on whether we're living in the tiny house or not, we are going to be at the Colorado Tiny House Festival. And I will be speaking there June 22nd through the 24th. I'm not sure exactly which day I'm speaking. And then I'll be, yeah, just talking about our journey and how the tiny, where the tiny house movement's going, what we're trying to do, and just how affordable housing is such a huge issue. And really, you know, it started off for our family as a journey of, you know, we want to change our lives. We want to be a model of sustainability because these things take way less utilities. Ours is almost completely non-toxic as best to, to our ability and our finances. And, you know, we just wanted to educate and show people that living sustainably in, is possible. And now it's sort of almost turning into this passion of affordable housing. We're really kind of being open to this reality that people aren't making enough money to afford the homes that are available. So that's been a really interesting change of a mission because tiny homes are just one affordable option. You know, we got container homes and yurts and campers, and it's really more a discussion of, you know, how can we make choices for affordable housing? Because apartments are running just even really small, apart, really junky, falling apart apartments can be a thousand dollars a month if you want to be near a job. So that's been an interesting journey. And so I've been doing a lot of research on affordable housing and, and kind of using that as a way to talk to cities is, you know, if, if you guys, this is just one other option. And since there's land open here in Colorado and many other places, why not make some options for people so that they can still have a home and home ownership and have a garden? And I get that question a lot. Why don't, hey, Emily, why don't you just live in an RV park? And I say, well, because I would like a community garden. I would like to own chickens. I would like to have a sense of community. And in the RV parks, you know, you, you don't get quite that because people are coming out for vacation. It's very loud. There's a lot of smoking and, and drinking and noise. And if that's your thing, that's great. But, uh, you know, raising a family and wanting to have organic food and clean air and clean water, it's not an option for everyone. And out here in Colorado, which is a new paradigm for me, is that the RV parks aren't really taking tiny homes as much anymore because they make more money off of the seasonal summer campers. So you can't have a tiny home taking a yearly spot where you can have, you know, 12, 15, 20 visitors through three months of summer. So that's another 
part we're running into now is that there's really even less places to park tiny homes. Once RV places figured out, well, why would I take this tiny house for half the price when I can have, be making a lot more off of this seasonal RV? I never thought about that. That's a really good point. And here in San Diego, housing is, you know, at 500 or even a thousand to surprise you just named. It's so, so crazy. And we have a lot of homeless people here too. So I'm actually really interested to hear more about the homeless uh, village. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes, actually, I have my notes right here. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> but you said you're also going to to interview some people. Yes, yes. So I will be interviewing Cole, and he is with the Colorado Village Collaborative, and they have a tiny house community in downtown Denver, and they have a. I think. Oh, I wish I could remember how many tiny houses. I believe it's like eight, possibly. And the tricky part with so they spoke with the De uh, Denver council members for six months, and the they have a temporary homeless housing code that they made, and they are only allowed to stay in a place for six months. And so the, with six months of discussion, they are allowed to temporarily stay for six months and then they have to move their entire operation to a new location. And luckily they did find a new location. So they will be at St. Andrew's church for the next six months stint. And so it's, you know, this constant move. So I am working with people in the tiny house community to just do a whole overhaul of the zoning laws, because how can we expect homeless people to, get you were telling them you need a job and then but you have to move every six months so now you no longer are close to your job so it's just it's mind-blowing and he had a, a statistic he got from the homeless shelters that 60 to 80 percent of the homeless in Denver have jobs yeah it's the same in San Diego he said a lot of people have jobs it just doesn't pay enough to pay for housing and food yeah that's crazy. And in the, another statistic I couldn't believe is he said that transgender pe couples and those with pets are not generally allowed in the government shelters. So that's where the inspiration for these tiny homeless tiny house communities came from is for those who didn't fit into the system. So that was really inspiring. Yeah, I hear we don't even have enough spaces. <laughs> you know, there's there are over five thousand homeless and I think they're like shelters with if the number I think the number is three hundred beds per night for five thousand, you know, and, and a lot of families and stuff. So it's it's really and, and of course we have a warm climate here. So if you're homeless, it's probably better to be homeless here than in Colorado or Minnesota, <laughs> you know, with snow and ice and all of that. But still, it is it is something I think is solvable, but there has to be some will. So what was the six months about? Said so people just don't want to have it in their area to say we don't want homeless in our area. That seems to be a problem here, you know, for permanent solutions. As far as my understanding was, the community actually was completely on board. It comes down to those making the zoning laws. So they don't believe that it's going to work. They don't believe that the mission is sustainable. So they just, you know, don't want to be responsible for that permanent responsibility. So... As of now, it, it, it kind of seemed like this was their way of budging a little bit as far as like, okay, fine, we'll change the zoning as long as this is a temporary thing. We don't want to make any long-term commitments on zoning changes. So that was my understanding. But, you know, when I interview him, he'll have a lot more info about how he, how those discussions went. I know from our perspective, I've tried tiny house communities here in Colorado and I've tried in Minnesota and 
normally it does come to their people are worried what kind of things will be happening. They don't want it to be like an RV park vibe where it's just going to be partying and drinking and drugs. And so people think that small dwellings equal that. So it's just one of those things that will take time and will take education. And that's sort of why I wrote the book and why I'm doing what I'm doing to just educate people that this is, we're doing this because one, it's sustainable. We don't need 4,000 square feet. And Two, that affordable housing is an issue and this is a way to combat that and that if home ownership is so important for a person's psyche, you feel grounded, you feel safe, it's, it's going to help people in all walks of life be able to better themselves in the future and make different choices. I can tell you from my experience living in multiple apartments and I've lived in a double wide trailer. And I've lived in a studio and I've lived in my parents' basement multiple times. And it's just, it's, it's not the same as home ownership. It doesn't feel the same because when you work hard to own something, you're going to take care of it. You're going to take care of yourself. You know, it's just such a different feel. So I think, you know, it, it's just kind of shifting the thinking of what kind of things home ownership can provide for people. Yeah, I totally can see that. I have rented for a long time. And when you have your own house, it just, you know, you can paint your wall purple if you want to. You don't have to ask someone. It's just a certain amount of freedom. I mean, it's added responsibility as well. But there is a certain amount of this is mine and it's my space and I can form the space how how I want, which I think makes a difference. Well, and I so appreciate you adding the responsibility part because, you know, again, that's where tiny homes come into play because, oh my gosh, there's just hardly any responsibility at all. It's like, it's like managing your bathroom or your living room. <laughs> it's so easy. <laughs> that is true. But, you know, your, your tiny house wasn't cheap. It's not like there. And, and you did this episode with a builder who really laid out there. There are certain things which you have to go into. So it, it's... You know, it's still a very, it's something you have to say for and you have to put energy in, yes. in terms of financial energy. And and you do have to take care of it. If yes. you have a leak in your roof, you know, you need to take care yeah. of it. You have to make sure you don't have mold growing, <laughs> you right. know, like lots of things. But yeah, I mean, well, you don't have plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> or not much. <laughs> it's it's less. Yeah, it's less of everything, but you're right. And I mean, I, I guess like, you know, that's those are the things that make memories, right? When you're like, oh my gosh, remember when our washer broke and we like Googled it and YouTube didn't fix it ourselves or, you know, it's kind of this sense of pride. Like it's it's this this idea of ownership and, and pride in your work and you're going to make a point to take care of it because it's yours and you worked hard for it. And the beautiful thing about tiny houses is there is a way to make them much, much cheaper and up to code. So that would be a fun thing for the tiny house community in the future. I know a lot of DIYers, I love the DIY movement and I would love to see people using, you know, reused materials. And there are people out there doing that. And then also having a contractor coming out and make it in, up to code because what we're, what we're running into is that if, if we want these communities, we have to prove to the city that they're safe, that they were done correctly, electricity, plumbing, you know, structure. So we have to make sure that all these, we're checking all these boxes. And even if these, the people who are doing it themselves, maybe, you know, they would just have to tweak it. So they, they would have like any home inspection, they'd have a home inspection and they say, okay, this is working, this isn't. And I'm sure many people would be happy to do that, to have a community. So there's just a really fun, bright future out there. And I know Andrew Morrison and several other tiny house trailblazers are working really hard to work on the, the code as, you know, the national code or federal. I'm, I'm not very good on the language if it's the federal code or national code or something about the builder's code, making tiny houses a part of that and making it work where those of us who are in wheels can have our own item line where here's what we have to follow since we're on wheels. So there's, it's really exciting stuff. The next few years are going to be really big for this movement. Yeah. There's always that 
time when something comes out of the um I don't know what the right word is, but but kind of the you know inventors and and people doing things differently, and then it becomes more popular and more people want to do it. You have to kind of step out. What is the word? Not the underground. So <laughs> it's the grassroots. Yeah, you know, and and deal with all the politics of making it possible to be incorporated into the mainstream and you know it's always bittersweet in many ways you know I'm thinking of of midwifery when I had my babies it was completely illegal to be a lay midwife and there were a lot of lay midwives <laughs> you know and I had my babies with them uh, and then midwives decided to come more into the mainstream for home births and so forth. But now they can do a lot of things. They used to be an alternative for people with breech babies or, you know, like things where the medical established would be sent to have a cesarean right away. So, you know, it's this bittersweet thing. And I'm sure there's some like that going to be happening with tiny homes that certain materials are not going to be able to be used and, and stuff like that. But on the other hand, it makes it accessible to a lot more people. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, you know, playing the game a little bit and meeting standards. And we do, we want these to be safe. We want these to be accessible. We want there to be a streamlined process. And I agree a hundred percent. It's going to be exactly like that. And I'm so spoiled because, you know, of course I get to be like, Hey, I get to have my home birth and I get to have my water birth and I get to do what I want at my house. And to have, you know, just, that's what we're trying to do for the tiny house movement is be those trailblazers so that down the road, people don't have to go through what we have been going through just to live in a sustainable way. And I think it's going to be really interesting too, to see as the generations shift, and there's new people on these city council members' positions, it's going to be interesting to see how things shift because we act as if large homes and suburban culture and life and building has been around forever. And it's actually barely been around at all if you look at human history. So it's really interesting to me that they're going down with such a big fight instead of being open to new ideas and opportunities and ways to solve problems. So I'm really excited to see as we get some new people in and see how that kind of changes the momentum of the movement as, you know, generations that, you know, if you've got people, younger generations coming in who have kids in college who have these huge student loans and there's no way they can buy a house, then they're going to say, oh, I guess we do have to solve this problem now because I would really appreciate if my my son or daughter could have a place to live that wasn't an apartment forever. You know, so it, as it gets more and more a part of people's reality, I think it's going to move even quicker. But as of now, there's still so many people who's are on the city council member positions and their kids do have enough opportunity and money to buy a home, but that's not going to be the case for much longer as things keep rising and income isn't matching the home prices and the homes that people are, are um, being, what is the word? Um, you know, they're, they're applying for these loans and they're getting approved at this absorbent amount. We were approved for a $450,000 home and we bought a $242,000 home and we were, I had two jobs and my husband had a full-time job and we have master's degrees and we were barely getting by. So I'm really interested to, you know, it's getting to a point where it's like, it's the current model isn't working because people are, all their money is going into their mortgage and then they're feeding their kids mac and cheese and cereal to get by. But at some point we have to make a shift and say, wait a minute, is this worth it? Wouldn't it be better if we have you know, food to eat and <laughs> food to eat. Gosh, you want a lot, right? <laughs> What's up? <laughs> I think that's asking for too much. <laughs> so, which which brings two questions to my mind. So, the first one is: Do you feel the resistance is actually coming 
from the people or is it more from the industry, which doesn't like the idea of, you know, being able to, obviously you make a lot more money if you build a 4,000 square foot home than when you build a tiny home. So do you think it's actually really the people which have that resistance or is it more the commercial interests, so to speak? It's actually both from my experience. So from the industry perspective, yes, people will not be getting the money that they want to get out of, you know, because everything's set up now. So, you know, builders are using certain people and the electricity companies and everyone's tied into this nice little happy package and everyone's making the money where they want it to be made. So that is one end. And on from the, the people's perspective, their constituents, at least the meetings we've gone to, all I hear is our constituents don't want this trashy looking small homes next to our beautiful community. So they, you know, and whether or not that's true is going to, you know, play itself out. It really depends on the community. It depends on the city. That hasn't been my experience because a lot of, you know, people think they're neat and cool and exciting, but whether or not they actually want them in their backyard is another story. So, yeah, I mean, I definitely think it comes from both. And we're trying to provide a model and say, well, look, we understand we're, yeah, we might be a little bit more solar, and but we can have all these solar panels and you can use the excess energy we make from our solar panels to help you with your electric grid. You know, we're, we're happy to tap into your sewage system if we need to, or if we're out in the country, we can have a nice little septic tank like anyone else. I actually am not even, I haven't quite figured out how water works here in Colorado because in Minnesota, water is plentiful. So I'm still figuring it out, but you know, we're happy to tap into what we need to. And also if we're not spending our money on our mortgage, we're going to be out spending money at those local businesses and supporting the community. So it actually ends up balancing out in the end. Maybe certain companies aren't going to be making that money that they want, but we're still putting money into the community, which is the overall goal is to support that local system. If that is the overall goal of, you know, the people, you don't know who gave actually the contribution to the election campaign, you know, but that, <laughs> that, uh, well, and I can see the argument. I, I see people a lot of times that they really like all houses to look the same and they feel that that house in the neighborhood with the, you know, five cars on the front yard is bringing down the resale value and stuff. That's, you know, a lot of people think about the home as money and investment, not as a home. That's always what freaks me out a little bit to me. It's like, you live there, it's your home, enjoy, <laughs> you know, but the second thing, the question I wanted to ask you, do you see yourself running for office to bring about those changes? Oh, gosh, I haven't even thought of it. <laughs> you know, I, I don't I can see my husband doing that. I am too much of a dreamer. I am too much. I actually have very little interest in the inner workings of politics. I am more like, I'm going to go inspire everybody and just make it happen. And so I like to be kind of the big dreamer and like, you know, just <laughs> having community events and it's possible. I, I really, my brain doesn't quite work that way. I'm very liberal artsy. So I would be more the one, you know, writing about it or taking pictures about it or blogging about it. But the inner workings to me are very confusing <laughs> and I'm too, I'm too much of like, Hey guys, let's work together. Who cares if we make money? Let's just do it and save the world. So I don't know that I would be the best person, but who knows? Maybe that actually would be a great, you know, maybe I'd be kind of the devil's advocate in the group or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, it, it maybe not you, but uh, people which have that kind of concern seems like, you know, I'm I'm a little bit, I grew up in a very political family and I have definitely some, uh, I don't know, uh, let's say frustration <laughs> with the political system. 
where it feels sometimes we can do whatever we want as an individual and no change change comes about. But it seems on a local level, it's maybe the most effective way to be politically active. And do you know who Starhawk is? I don't. Okay, so she is a, a leader in the permaculture world. She is a... And, um, maybe in the social permaculture world, if you want to put it that way, she has a farm, but she has uh, done a lot of workshops and she has written several books. And of course, I can't even remember one title right now. But her whole thing is is stepping like you into leadership. If we want to see a change, we need to make that change happen, right? And one of the things she was saying, and I... <laughs> You know, I don't remember which state. I think it was in Utah somewhere. A small community where where a lot of alternative people were moving to. And they all were hands off with politics. They just didn't want to have anything to do with it. And the city council ended up, people got voted into the city council, which had very different ideas from them. And they were able to make policy which affected everybody. So, you know, as, as, and I'm more like you too, that I have some big ideas and I want to bring this together and, and let's create community and let's do all of those things. And I'm, ah, I think bored is maybe the right word. You know, there is so much tediousness about city council meetings and, and you know, figuring out all those things that it's not appealing to me, but on, on one and it's really something we all need to do if we want to see the change, right? If we step away, somebody else can take control and, and do it. So that, that was just, you know, my question is like, okay, is that part of your plan of or of the plan of the people you're working with that somebody will go and, and run for city council to have that voice, you know, said that, that it's an insider voice, not a, a voice coming from the outside. I definitely, you know, that's why my husband and I make such a great team. He actually, his bachelor degree is in political science and his master's is in business. So I'm like, you know, we make a great team so I can be the one behind the scenes being like, here's the vision, here's the dream. And he can go out there and make it happen. So it's definitely on the radar, you know, and I agree. And I wrote in my book too, you know, we, we have to embody the change. We can't just sit and point fingers. We're at a, at the point where our society is so busy surviving that everyone just points a finger at that evil person or that evil corporation. And yet we all go shop at it and we all go support it with our money. So it really, yeah, from the political side, yes, get involved, you know, get, go to the events, you know, go to the peaceful marches and whatnot. And, but also be, remember that in this current life, money is, is where you're voting. So if you if you want things to change, make sure you're not you're supporting you are supporting companies that follow your values. That's such an excellent point. We really do vote with our money every every single day <laughs> with what we purchase or not purchase, you know, what we choose to allow into our life and what we don't allow in. Yeah. Cool. So should we wrap it up? Do you have some else you would like to share for today? Oh, no, I'm just really excited to, you know, keep some amazing guests coming on. And I'm looking forward to, I, I, I see a lot of really big things happening this summer. So just really excited to see what goes on and getting some more farmers on there. Remember, everyone, plant your own garden. Like, it's getting time. Get you, Feed yourself and save yourself some money. Get together with your neighbors. And you can all plant different things to make sure that you can share so you're not all planting cucumbers and everyone has 400 cucumbers. And, <laughs> <laughs> and nobody wants them. <laughs> It's a time where people are running when they see zucchini coming out of somebody's <laughs> back. <laughs> I love zucchini, so. <laughs> oh, me too, me too. Yeah, very cool. So, yeah, great, Emily. I'm so glad we got to talk and uh, looking forward to listen to your podcast with a homeless tiny uh, house person. 
that is something I'm really, really interested in. And I actually have a friend in Colorado in what is another big city? Spring, Springs, Colorado Springs. Yeah. Yeah. Colorado Springs, where he's doing a lot of work with homeless. So I should connect you to. Oh, that'd be great. Yes. Thank you. And thank you so much for the wonderful discussion. And I can't wait to hear more what is coming from this amazing podcast. And I appreciate everything you do. Well, thank you. (laughs) 